Okay, so these are the notes for our early leaders as they're trying to create a new nation. Uh, on our last notes, we talked about George Washington, the first presidency, and how that was kind of a testing ground for the new constitution. And now we're going to focus on the second and third presidents, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, as they create a American government and American identity. Uh, so let's keep in mind what our themes are that we discussed in class, because we are creating America. All right, and keep in mind we got two branches of that. We've got an American identity, and we've got American government. Right, the election of 1796 was a, it was an interesting one, but it, it also pitted our first political rivals against one another, the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans, or just Republicans, what would later be known as the Democrats. Adams is going to win in a very close race, and Thomas Jefferson is going to be his vice president. Uh, keep in mind, the why is because of the way our electoral college works and the way the ballot system works, where everybody voted twice, uh, once for president, once for vice president, you know, kind of a first and second type of thing, but they didn't indicate who they voted for. So the winner of the votes would come out as president, and the runner-up would come out as vice president. Later on, the 12th Amendment's going to change that, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, one thing that's important to note is that the uh, North and South were already divided uh, politically, uh, and it's really just because of what their commercial interests were. The South were very much in line with trade, which was very much a uh, Federalist uh, type of commerce, and the South was very, very involved in agriculture, uh, which was definitely in Jefferson's vision of that idea of what America should be, which is the uh, you know, land of free yeoman farmers, which is basically just that everybody owns their own land and the government stays out of their business. Now immediately upon coming into office, Adams is going to be faced with a crisis that was actually left over from George Washington. Uh, France is in turmoil because they're in the throes of a revolution, and America is kind of pitted in between Britain and France. Uh, America had increased relations with Great Britain through trade, uh, which was very, very profitable to us, and it's not something we wanted to abandon. France didn't like this. On top of this, we're not paying France the debt that we owe them from war because we made that agreement with King Louis, and King Louis dead. In the French Revolution, they beheaded him. So we're not paying off the debt to those people. Adams eventually is going to send three men to go over to France to talk because they have been denying our ambassadors entry into their country. And France is going to virtually just refuse to meet with them. They're going to refuse their credentials, so on and so forth. But they're going to send coded messages. And each person in the code uh, would be known as X, Y, and Z. So they would make themselves out into uh, letters to represent who they were. A newspaper in America is going to get hold of who the uh, Frenchmen were making themselves out to be, which was coded names XYZ, and it's going to be published in the headlines, which is why we had the XYZ affair today. Um, but interestingly enough, these men are going to refuse to meet with our diplomats unless we give them $250,000 and a $12 million loan. Uh, so essentially the XYZ affair is just these hostilities between America and France and France refusing to meet with our ambassadors. At the same time, Adams is having to deal with a quasi-war situation. Now, remember what quasi is, what we talked about in class. It's essentially just a fake war. Whoops. All right. Um, because we're not paying off debt, we're not helping them with the British. French, the French fleets are actually seizing some of our ships abroad out on the ocean. Uh, and you can imagine many do not like this in America, especially those involved in trade, the Federalists. They want retaliation. But... Adams refuses to declare war. He stays very much in line with that uh, Washington, excuse me, he stays very much in line with that Washington mentality of staying out of the foreign affairs. Now, Republicans are not really going to feed on this because they're more inclined to help the French because they feel like they're brothers in revolution. But because of this decision, Adams is going to lose a lot of Federalist supporters in the next election. Eventually, France is going to initiate a peace, and the quasi war will come to an end without us having to get involved in Europe. Another aspect of the Adams administration was the uh, creation of the Alien and Sedition Acts. Um, there was a strong anti-British feeling in America, uh, essentially because we were revolutionaries and we felt France was our brothers in revolution. Uh, and we were also getting 
a surge of immigrants that were looking for land because they wanted to make a new. They were poor, they wanted their own land, and they wanted to live without government intervention, which keep in mind that was very much in line with the Jefferson ideal of what America should be. So a lot of these are going to come out to be Democratic Republicans. So you've got a lot of Democratic Republicans in the country, uh, a lot of foreign Democratic Republicans that are very pro-French. You can imagine the sentiment. In 1798, the Alien and Sedition Acts are going to be passed to combat this surge of immigration and idea. Now, the Alien and Sedition Acts essentially created this situation where if you came into the country, if you were new to the country, you had to have residency 14 years. It used to be five. They raised the amount of residency, and this would go into vote, naturalization, so on and so forth. Another aspect of it is, is the president could jail or deport anybody that they didn't think was desirable. So if you came in and you were already a revolutionary radical, they jail you or send you away. But another aspect that really made a lot of the, the uh, Republicans mad, the Democratic Republicans mad, was the Sedition Act, which is where the government would jail or fine anyone or any newspaper hindering the operation of the government. And a lot of people would be jailed. Uh, some Republican supporters are going to be jailed for them speaking out against the Adams administration. Now, is this legal? You know, the First Amendment it specifically says in there that there is a freedom of the press and freedom of free speech. You can imagine Republicans are really going to hate this law. They think that this is an attack on them and on liberty and on their supporters. And they're going to draft up the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions uh, for state declarations to combat these actions. Uh, Virginia is actually going to be drafted up by James Madison, and Kentucky is going to be, excuse me, uh, Thomas Jefferson. Sorry about that. It's supposed to be a T there. Keep in mind, though, the Federalist point of view on this. All right, They want to prevent war. They don't want to go to war overseas. Adams wants to prevent war. This is seen as keeping a rift from growing in America. The Alien and Sedition Act is put in place to prevent radicals from causing a civil war, essentially. So uh, don't lose sight of their argument as well. Because Adams loses support over the uh, quasi-war and because of the Alien and Sedition Acts really rallying Republican support, um, Adams is going to be defeated in the election of 1800. Jefferson and Adams are going to run it again. Jefferson's going to have Aaron Burr as his running mate. Both of these men are going to beat Adams, but they're going to have the exact same amount. It's going to be a tie. So the vote is going to go to the Congress, and you can imagine in Congress there's a lot of Federalists that would really like to irritate Thomas Jefferson and not elect him president. So there's a big back and forth. Eventually, the House of Reps decides that Jefferson is going to win. Oops, crossed his name out. But Jefferson ends up winning. After this, in 1804, the 12th Amendment is going to be uh, signed into law and ratified and added to the Constitution, which means that now we have separate ballots for president and vice president. It doesn't change our electoral college. It essentially just says that when you go to vote, you indicate who you're voting for for president and who you're voting for for vice president. Now, Jefferson is a rather interesting president. He promises unity. He cuts taxes. He cuts spending on the Army and Navy. He downsizes them because he thinks that a country that is supposed to be uh, or is supposed to demonstrate liberty should not have a massive military. But he does want to expand the U.S. territory because keep in mind Jefferson's vision. He wants land. He wants geometry farming. Uh, that's his future for America. And keep in mind what Jefferson was in the past to a strict constructionist got to have that strict view on the Constitution and how it's going to shape his decisions. Now at the time, um, France is pretty busy. you got the Revolution, but you also have the Napoleonic Wars that have started up as well. So you got to pay credence to what's going on there. Uh, war costs money. An easy way to get money is to sell land. Now Jefferson's going to hint at taking the land by force, but the French are finally just going to sell the land to us for about $15 million. And I told you the story in class about kind of how it went down. But the important thing to remember here is how Jefferson kind of evolves in his view. The Constitution does not say that the president can buy land, but keep in mind that buying land goes back into Jefferson's vision. Uh, this is something that's going to cause him some internal conflict as well because he had this strict constructionist view of the Constitution, but it does evolve. Uh, regardless of what you think of this decision or if Jefferson's a hypocrite, the U.S. is going to acquire 828,000 square miles of land for only $15 million. So roughly, America went from right here, not Florida, Spain owns Florida, but we went from right here, and we acquired all this land, or acquired all this land over here. So a pretty good buy. 
And of course, when you get new land, you have to settle it, and you have to create territories, but you also have to explore it and find out what's there. And this is where you have one of the famous expeditions, the most famous expeditions in U.S. history, the Lewis and Clark uh, journey. Meriwether Lewis and William Clark, they lead an expedition to explore the Louisiana Territory. They leave in 1804. Accompanying them is a very famous Indian woman named Sacagawea, who leads them along the way and helps them communicate with the native tribes. They're going to reach the Pacific Ocean in 1805, and they're going to create and send back to Washington valuable maps and routes of territory. They had been looking for water passages and other ways to get quickly to the Pacific Ocean. So what they provide is very, very useful. The last thing to talk about about the first uh, or the second and third president is the midnight judges. Uh, if you ever get a chance to Google uh, president's last day of office and see the kind of the things they do, a lot of times they sign a bunch of pardons. In Adams' case, he appointed 217 Federalist judges that were loyal to him to various uh, positions in the government. And he does this the night before he leaves office. So you can imagine the next day Jefferson comes in, he's got all this Federalist opposition, it makes him mad. So he orders Madison, Secretary of State, to cancel the orders. Madison delivers the cancellation letter to William Marbury. Marbury doesn't like this. He sues to the Supreme Court asking his appointment letter to be delivered. And this is going to lead us to a very famous case known as Marbury versus Madison. Uh, the case happens in 1803. John Marshall is the Chief Justice. Keep in mind, he is a Federalist, but this is a tricky situation. Uh, he knows if he goes along the line of the Federalists that the Republicans are going to be angry at him, but he also knows if he does nothing, it's going to look like the Supreme Court's weak, so he's got to do something. He says the Supreme Court, even though Marbury should have gotten the letters, cannot order the papers delivered. They cannot order, because keep in mind what their job is. They pass judgment. They do not enforce laws. However, what he did do in the process of making this decision is he established judicial review, which is the most important thing that we need to take away from this. And what this means is because of judicial review, the Supreme Court can look at an act that Congress passes and declare it unconstitutional. It doesn't have to come, through, come to them through the appeals court like it did in the past. Now they can just take an act, look at it, declare it unconstitutional, and that's the end of the law. Okay? This is the end of the notes for the first two presidents. Um, keep in mind when you're taking these notes, try to divide them out in your head, keep in line with the themes, uh, which aspects of the notes is creating an American government, and which aspects is creating an American identity. Uh, sometimes they conflict. All right? uh, next up, we'll have the War of 1812.